Hello, my name is Sanj Kakar. I'm a professor of orthopedic surgery at Mayo Clinic and my specialist interest in hand and wrist surgery. Thank you for joining us today, where today we're going to spend some time going over the physical examination of the wrist. This is critical when you're seeing patients with wrist pain because most of the time patients can indicate where the pathology is and by using certain dynamic tests you'll be able to have a good idea of what the pathology is before getting advanced imaging such as x-rays, an MRI or a CT scan. I'd like to acknowledge my mentors essentially in hand and wrist surgery, Mark Garcia Lais and Dick Berger. Over the years through their seminal teachings they've taught many of us some of these important pearls that I'll hopefully share with you today. So the goals of today are to go over the pertinent anatomy of the hand and wrist and also go over the physical examination, not only on the slides where I wanna share the anatomy with you, but also in a live demonstration. So in terms of the anatomy, when you think of the wrist, there are essentially two rows of carpal bones, the proximal and the distal carpal row. And each carpal row has four bones in them. The proximal carpal row comprises of the scaphoid, the lunate triquetrum, the distal carpal row comprises the hamate, the capitate, the trapezoid, and the trapezium. On the volar side of the proximal carpal row is the pisiform. Now these are joined together by thick ligaments. Essentially, these are ropes holding the bones together. So when we think of the distal carpal row, we have the trapezoid trapezium ligament, we have the capitotrapezoid ligament, and we have the capitohamate ligament. And these are form robust interconnections between the bones. The majority of the pathology, however, when we see regarding ligaments are in the proximal carpal row. And the two most important proximal carpal row ligaments are the scaphalunate ligament and the lunar triquetral ligament. The surface anatomy is critical when examining the hand and wrist. And in today's live model, you'll see how many important structures are just below the skin. And just by taking your finger using tactile motion, can you delineate the pathology? Think of this as an iceberg concept. Whatever you see on the top row, you have to go deeper to this, as this is where your pathology really lies. My mnemonic when I'm examining the wrist is STAND. Usually in orthopedics, we're taught look, feel, and move. I use the acronym of STAND. S stands for the skin. Look for any scars, any lacerations, any bumps or any bruises, because that can indicate where the pathology is. T are the tendons, and these are the ropes that allow you to move your fingers. And it's important to specifically identify and examine each tendon. A stands for the arteries, which are essentially the pipes that give you the blood supply to the hand. N are the nerves. Now we have important motor and sensory nerves that we need to examine. And D are the dynamic maneuvers that you need to critically look for the areas of pathology. Now, when you think of this in terms of the dorsal hand anatomy, if we've taken the skin off, you can see this nice cadaveric di dissection by Mark Garcia Elias, where he shows us those ropes. And those ropes are contained into six extensive compartment tendons. Here they're labeled. The first extensive compartment is the EPB and the APL. The second extensive compartment is the ECRL and the ECRB. The third extensive compartment is the EPL, which has a curvy linear course going ulna to a bony prominence on the dorsal radial aspect of the wrist called Lister's tubercle. The fourth extensive compartment contains the EDC tendons that move the index, long ring, and small finger. But the index and small finger also have their independent extensor tendons, namely the EIP. The fifth extensor compartment is the EDM that moves the small finger. And finally, the ECU is the sixth extensor compartment tendon, which is the only extensor tendon that runs with the ulna. Here you can see in this intraoperative picture, we've opened up the extensor retinaculum, which is that lining that covers all the extensor tendons. And you can see the ECU runs with the ulna in its ECU subsheath. Now we've removed the extensor tendons out of the way. And what we've done is now we've opened up the capsule, which is the lining of the joint and we've re released this from distal to proximal. And as we peel these back, you can see the carpal bones. And through the live examination today, we'll show you how to independently assess and feel for these carpal bones. It can be overwhelming when you examine the wrist. There are so many structures to examine. How do you do this in a sequential systematic method? So what I like to do is divide the wrist into thirds. Essentially, if I take a line and draw it along Lister's tubercle, you have a lot of tendons and bones to the radial side of the line. And for example, the scaphoid is the first bone that we'll examine. Now, if I draw a line along the DIUJ, 
you'll now have pathology basically radial to that line, and that's namely the lunate, which is the most proximal bone, and we'll show you how to do that. When you go ulnar to this line, you now have the ulnar carpal joint. So now if we look at this schematic, what are we looking at? Remember I taught you about that dorsal structure being list as tubicle? That's your gateway to the wrist. So if we come just distal and radial to list as tubicle, radial to that line, you'll feel the proximal pole of the scaphoid. If you go between that list as tubicle line and the DIUJ, you'll have the lunate. And just ulnar to that line, you'll have the distal ulna. It's that specific. As we come distal to this, you'll see the ECU tendon. And the most dorsal ulnar structure on the wrist is called the triquetrum. And that is an important structure because sometimes you can get lost. But if you can find this bone, you can feel your way around the wrist. Now, just distal to the triquetrum is the hamate. Between the hamate and the trapezoid is the capitate. And that is collinear with the lunate. Now, radial to the capitate is the a trapezoid. And then the final bone is the trapezium, which is adjacent to the thumb metacarpal. And this is critical because a lot of patients come in with basal or thumb joint arthritis. We also have to do special tests. Now, if you slightly flex the wrist down, just distal to list as tubicle, there's a soft spot. And essentially, there's four structures that can emanate from here, or four pathologies, namely a scaphalunate ligament problem, an occult ganglion, synovitis, for example, gymnus, and fourthly, if the wrist goes into maximal wrist extension quickly, the scaphoid can be an impact on the dorsal aspect of the radius, and we'll show you those today. So here we're looking at Ellen's hand. Ellen is our hand model today, and we're looking at the dorsum of the hand. So in terms of inspection, or S, in looking at the skin, are there any issues? Are there any scars? Is there any swelling to indicate where the pathology may be? Is there a laceration? So you can see here, she has no evidence of any trauma or injury to her wrist. T stands for the tendons. Now, there are essentially six extensor compartments to the hand. The first extensor compartment is the first dorsal extensor compartment, and this runs on the radial side of the hand, and it comprises the EPB and the APL. So sometimes patients will have pain and swelling in this area. Do you have any pain or swelling today, Ellen, in your wrist? No. no? And what they have difficulties, for example, is when they only deviate their wrist. So the classic um, diagnosis here is called de Quervain's tenosynovitis, which is inflammation of the first extensor compartment tendons. And essentially what one does, you can palpate here, and if they ever have any pain, you have to look at your uh, model or your patient, make sure they have no pain. That sometimes is a very sensitive test. In addition, what you can do is take the thumb and just flex it down as such, and if they have pain here and they jump, that will tell you that this patient most likely has inflammation of the first dorsal compartment. The second extensor compartment comprises the ECRL, which inserts into the radial base of the index finger, and the ECRB, which inserts into the base of the long finger. And these tendons essentially come from the radial aspect down. Now they are covered, as they come down, they're called the outcropper tendons, they're covered by the first dorsal compartment tendons. So sometimes patients will come in and point to pain in this area here, and that's called intersection syndrome, where those tendons run under the first dorsal compartment. And the beauty of the hand is that most patients can come and pinpoint with one finger where their pathology is. And so if I would flex her wrist down, that would essentially may cause some discomfort in this area here. Another way to examine these uh, tendons is, Ellen, if you make a fist and pull your wrist hard at back, as she pulls her wrist hard back, you can feel these tendons firing. And this is the ECRL and the ECRB, and just relax. The third extensor compartment is called the EPL, or the extensor pollicis longus. So Ellen, if you put your hand flat on the table, the easiest way to delineate this is it touch my thumb up here with your finger. You can see how she extends at her uh, IP joint, and this is where the extensor tendon runs, right, uh, ulna to the Lister's tubercle. Now what's Lister's tubercle? Lister's tubercle is a bony prominence right at the back of the wrist. And this is important because everything just radial to this is the second extensor compartment, and just ulnar to this is the EPL. And raise your th thumb up again, Ellen. So as I test here, the actual tendon runs in this sort of curvy linear manner, ulnar to Lister's tubercle. The fourth extensor compartment is essentially the extensor indices proprius and the extensor digitorum communis, or the EDC. Now, the index finger has two extensor tendons. So Ellen, if you make a fist and raise your index finger up, that is the EIP, okay? So you can see she can uh, independently ex extend the index finger. Now what I want you to do is um, raise up your pinky. That is the EDM, or the extensor digiti minimi of the small finger. This also has two extensor tendons, 
And the course of the extensor digitally minimi runs literally over the DIUJ, which is right here. So some patients may come, come in with pain over the DIUJ, and it's important to examine the uh, extensor tendon to the small finger because they could have pathology over this as well. So now if you raise your index and your small finger together, so this is the EIP of the index finger, the EDM of the small finger. Now, if she raises all the fingers, that's the EDC. So that's what you can see now. We've examined the EIP to the index finger, the EDM, which is the fifth extensor compartment, and the fourth extensor compartment tendons also to these fingers. The final extensor tendon is called the EC or the extensi carpi ulnaris, which essentially runs from the lateral aspect of the elbow all the way down to insert in the base of the fifth metacarpal. Now this is a very important tendon because it's the only extensor tendon that independently runs with the ulna. And it's important for forearm kinematics as the radius, the carpus and the hand all rotate around the ulna and the ulna is a fixed unit of the forearm that allows pronosupination. Now we're gonna talk about the ECU. And uh, a nice test for this is called the Synergy test. So Ellen, if you have your fingers up straight, and what I do is I just grab the first three fingers. Okay, and now what I want you to do is spread those fingers wide. Spread the thumb wide, good. So what she's doing is that she's firing the ECRL. And remember the ECRL is in the second extensor compartment. And what that would do in firing the ECRL is that it will take the wrist into radial deviation. So the brain is very clever. So to keep the wrist centralized, it will fire the ECU. So even without touching her, if she spreads her fingers against resistance and she complains of pain in this area here, that will tell you that the patient has some ECU synovitis or pathology. So it's a very nice screening method. So as she spreads her fingers, she doesn't have any pathology today, but this is where she would be having pain if she had ECU tenus synovitis. So now once I've got that in my mind, the next thing what I'll do is just relax for me is turn her wrist towards me this way. And now I know that the ECU is running right here adjacent to the ulna. Remember, it's fixed to the ulna in its ECU subsheath. So now what I'd like you to do, Ellen, is push your, your small finger into my thumb. Push your wrist. So as she's pushing into ulna deviation, I can palpate the ECU and always watch her face to see if she jumps. So it's another way to look at the ECU. So so in just going over this hand model and just going over the tendons, now the first dorsal compartment tendons, remember we talked about the EPB and the APL, they run under this sheath. And the sheath is essentially a band that keeps the extensor tendons located in position. And this is where patients will have de Quervain's tenosynovitis, it's inflammation of the tendons underneath here. Now if we look at the back of the hand, the second extensor compartment tendons are the ECRL and the ECRB, and you can see that they're running uh, ulna to the first dorsal compartment. The EPL, which is the third extensor compartment tendon, you can see, uh, which allows you to extend the thumb at the IP joint, runs in this curvilinear manner, ulna to Lister's tubercle, and Lister's tubercle would sit right here. The fourth extensor compartment tendons, or the EDC, you can see are right here, which go to the index, long, ring, and small finger. The EIP, which also runs to the uh, index finger, which runs ulna to the index finger, has the distal most muscle belly. And the fifth extensor compartment tendon, or the EDM, which powers your small finger, runs directly over the DIUJ. The final extensor uh, compartment that we examined was the ECU, and you can see that that runs attached to the ulna over the ulnar aspect. So we've already looked at the skin, we've examined the tendons. On the back of the wrist, there really isn't many arteries to examine. The next thing, N, is the nerves, and there's two main nerves to examine. We have the dorsal sensory branch of the radial nerve, which you, you can see goes to the thumb, index, and long, and the radial border of the ring finger, and the dorsal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve, which is this green nerve that runs to the small finger over here. So it's important to examine this because sometimes patients will come in with pain, or they have difficulty, for example, putting a watch on, or putting their sleeve of their shirt because it can irritate the, the nerve in this region. And so the way that we do this, so here now, when I look at Ellen's hand, I'm looking for the dorsal sensory branch of the radial nerve. Do you have any tingling or pain in this area? No. So what I will do, sometimes if the patients do come in, is I would tap, and that's called a tenel sign, to see where they're maximally tender. Now, if somebody, for example, has sustained a superficial laceration underneath the skin, and it was closed, but they have pain in this area, you worry that sometimes they may have cut that nerve. The second nerve is to look at the dorsal sensory branch, the ulnar nerve that runs from volar to dorsal, giving innovation and sensation to the back of the hand on the ulna side. And again, she has normal sensation. The next thing is D. D stands for the dynamic maneuvers of the hand and wrist. And this is critical. 
because oftentimes when patients come in with pathology, it's really important that these specialized tests are performed to delineate the pathology. So if we look at Ellen's back of the hand, essentially I'm gonna divide it into thirds. So remember I talked about Lister's tubercle. So Lister's tubercle sits right about here. If I just draw a, a longitudinal line down Lister's tubercle, I think of everything radial to this. I then draw another line along the distal radial ulnar joint or the DRUJ, which runs here. So now essentially I've divided the wrist into thirds. I have the radial third, the central third, and the ulnar third. And that is important to know because in each third runs different bones and different ligaments. So in my mind's eye, I've drawn the lines down. So now what I'll do is I'll take her wrist and I'll gently flex this at about 30 degrees of flexion because that brings all the dorsal carpal structures uh, to the surface. So the first thing that I wanna feel is, is the scaphoid. So now I failed the Lister's tubercle and I've slightly palmally flexed and this brings up the proximal pole of the scaphoid right here. And so I'll press right here. Any pain or discomfort in here? Yeah. Okay, so that's her scaphoid. Now remember I talked about that line at Lister's tubercle. If I come straight down this line, there is the scaphalunate ligament. And that is a critical structure to appreciate. This is a structure that's commonly injured when somebody has a wrist sprain and the x-rays are negative, and yet they continue to have pain in their wrist. And this is a scaphalunate ligament injury, which would be in this area. Essentially, there's four key diagnoses in this area. Number one, could it be an occult dorsal wrist ganglion? Number two, is it a scaphalunate ligament pathology? Number three, is there synovitis or inflammation in that area, for example, in a gymnast? And number four, when the wrist goes into maximal wrist extension, does the scaphoid impact onto the radius? So those are the four differential diagnoses that you need to understand in this region. In my mind's eye, remember I drew those lines. So if I come ulnar to this line, this is the lunate, which is the keystone of the wrist. And so this lies between that radial line and that ulnar line. So here's got the lunate. And now I remember where the DIUJ line is. I palpate here. This is the lunotriquetral ligament. And as I come ulnar, the most dorsal ulnar structure on the wrist is the triquetrum. So this is a triquetrum. So it's that specific. So when patients come in, really ask them to take their finger and imagine it's a hot poker stick and stick it where it hurts. Because of the surface anatomy of the wrist, you can really identify where the pathology is. Now, having examined the proximal carpal row, I'm now gonna go in the distal carpal row. So now remember my finger is on the triquetrum. So I come just distal to the triquetrum and that's the hamate. And sometimes patients can have pain in here called a halt legion, which stands for hamate arthrosis lunotriquetral instability. Now, if I come radial to the uh, hamate in that central third, so just distal to the lunate is the capitate. So that's the capitate right here. Now, if I come radial to the capitate, you have the trapezoid. And then the last bone to examine on the dorsum of the wrist is the trapezium. And the best way to look at the trapezium, and this is important, for example, for thumb arthritis, which is very, very common, especially for patients, for example, who have difficulty opening jars, turning a key or opening a door, is basal thumb joint arthritis. So now we're gonna examine for the trapezium. So if I take her thumb and wiggle this up and down, this is essentially the thumb metacarpal. And when I press right here, that is a trapezium. And this can be very, very tender for patients who have basal or thumb joint arthritis because usually what happens is that the thumb metacarpal subluxates dorsally. And by pushing down here, you're essentially reducing that arthritic joint, which causes pain. The next thing I want to explain is the scaphoid shift test. Now, what is this? Now, when you have scaphalunate ligament pathology, this is essentially a nice test to delineate scaphalunate problems. Now, normally what happens when you only deviate the wrist, the scaphoid is extended. And when you radially deviate, it goes into flexion. Now, when the scaphalunate ligament is injured, when you go into radial deviation, and if you put your thumb on the distal pole of the scaphoid, it will prevent the flexion of the scaphoid, and as a result, you can drive the scaphoid out of the back of the wrist, which causes pain and clunking. Now, this can be a painful test in a patient with scaphalunate ligament pathology, so this is probably one of the last tests that you wanna do when finishing the exam. So my thumb is on the distal pole of the scaphoid. My index finger is on the back of the scaphoid. Now, in ulnar deviation, the scaphoid is extended. When I go into radial deviation, it flexes. So in Ellen, who doesn't have any pathology, this will be a normal examination. However, with pathology, patients will have pain and clunking at the back. So what I do is take the wrist from ulnar deviation to radial deviation, and my thumb feels her scaphoid flexing. 
Now, with a scaphalunate ligament injury, my thumb would block the scaphoid from flexing and it would cause pain and clunking at the back of the wrist. The next structure to examine is the lunar troquetral ligament. And this is an important ligament on the ulnar side of the wrist. And essentially, there's three key tests to delineate this. The first is the compression test described by Dr. Linscheid. And essentially what you're doing is compressing the triquetrum into the lunate and seeing if that's causing any pain or pathology. Essentially what you're doing is stressing the joint in different planes. So one of the tests is called the Linscheid compression test. And what we're doing here is that you can take your thumb and you're basically pushing the triquetrum next to the lunate, trying to cause pain in that direction. So any pain in that when I'm doing that? No. Okay. The second test is the shear test described by Dr. Kleinman. And what you're doing here is taking your thumbs, trying to rock that lunar troquetral joint back and forth and seeing if you're causing pain by the inflammation within the joint. And the easiest way to do this is you take your thumb on the palmer side and your thumb on the opposite side and essentially you're shearing the LT and seeing if that causes any pain. And in her, she has no pathology and that causes her no pain. And the third test described by Dr. Regan is a shuck test. Essentially what you're doing is that you're holding the wrist and the carpus together with one hand and you're moving the piezotroquetral joint back and forth. And again, that shear is trying to elicit lunar trochutral joint pathology. So I basically stabilized a whole wrist with my right hand. So the radius and the carpus and the hand are secure. Now I take my thumb and my index finger of my left hand and they're on the piezoform and the triquetrum. And remember the triquetrum is the most dorsal ulna structure on the ulna side of the wrist opposed to the distal ulna. And I'm basically shearing it back and forth. And this is called the shuck test. The next way is to think of how to scoop out ice cream. If you think about when you're scooping out ice cream, you flex, you only deviate and you supinate the wrist. So if you do that against resistance, and again, we'll show you in the live examination, this will also delineate ECU pathology. Think about how you get ice cream. You flex, you only deviate, and you supinate. Doing that maneuver will really stress the ECU in its subsheath. So what I'd ask the patient to do is, Ellen, just pretend you're scooping out ice cream. Okay, so as she's doing it against resistance, go. So she's flexing, she's only deviating, and she's supinating. If she has pain in this area, that's another test to look for ECU pathology. We talked about the triquetrum, but just adjacent to the triquetrum is the piezoform or the piezotriquetral joint. And sometimes patients will come in complaining of pain either in this area or in this area here. And so what I've done is I can feel this mobile structure here called the piezoform. So now what I can do is you can grab the piezoform and now what I'm doing is compressing against the triquetrum to see if there's any crepitus and also moving it back and forth. And so that's uh, examining the piezotriquetral joint. One of the most common causes for patients to come and see a physician is ulnar wrist pain. And ulnar wrist pain is like the low back pain of the wrist. It can be very, very confusing. So the clinical exam is critical. Imaging such as MRI, CT scans, x-rays can be sometimes normal or can lead to false positives. So the clinical exam is critical. And so what we're looking at for here is the TFCC. The next test is called the fovea sign. And this is a critical test to look for TFCC or triangulofibrocartilage complex pathology or ulnar triquetral ligament split tears. It was described to us by Dr. Berger many, many years ago. And if you use your thumb and your index finger, you can point to the area that causes maximal pathology, which essentially sits in this anatomical snuff box in the wrist. Essentially, just dorsal and ulnar to the FCU tendon. There's a soft spot here, and essentially two structures are here, namely the TFCC or the ulnar triquetral ligament, to me, I look at them essentially as the same thing. They're a continuity of each other in terms of the test and also the dorsal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve. So what I like to do is, Ellen, just flex your wrist down as hard as you can. And so you can see as she flexes down, she's firing the FCU and just relax. So knowing that that's where the FCU is, what I do is I take my thumb or my index finger and I push right up this area. Now, this area can be uncomfortable in normal wrists. Now, if you have pathology in this area, to me, that tells me there's a TFCC or an ulnar triquetral ligament split tear, or potentially a neuroma of the dorsal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve. So that is very important for the TFCC. The next thing that we want to look for is stability of the distal radial ulnar joint. We'll also show you how to examine the distal radial ulnar joint, and this allows you to pronosupinate. And so you'll see in this patient how in neutral rotation, how the DIEJ moves back and forth, and then I'm going to pronation, and supination. And we'll show you today how to delineate normal DIEJ anatomy. When patients, for example, have TFCC pathology, it's important to see if the wrist is stable or unstable. So we look at this in neutral 
supination and pronation. And it is critical that you examine the contralateral normal side and then examine the injured side because you can pick up subtle instabilities in that way. And usually this is the last thing that I will do because most patients with ulnar wrist pain, they hurt in the TFCC region. So this will be the last exam that we would do. So just relax for me. So what I've done is I'll just take the DIUJ and I'll rock it forward in back and forth in neutral. So this is her normal state. Now what I've done is I've rotated her wrist in full supination, and essentially with my left hand, I've got the carpus and the radius all locked. So the only thing that can move in this area is the DIUJ. So we examine the DIUJ neutral. Now in full supination, I rock, rock it back and forth. You can see how stable that is. And then finally, I'll test it in pronation. So in full pronation, now I'll move the distal radial ulnar joint back and forth. And you can actually see how it's a little bit more unstable in pronation and in neutral and tightens up in supination. The last test that I like to do is called the ulnar impaction test. Now, sometimes in full pronation, the ulnar is relatively longer than the radius. And some patients will come in with ulnar wrist pain, complaining of pain right here when they forcefully grip. So what we've done now is made the ulnar relatively longer than the radius. And what I'll do is essentially shift the ulnar carpal joint into the distal ulna, seeing if that causes any pain. That's called the ulnar impaction shear test that I'm pushing against here. Okay, so now we've detailed the dorsal wrist exam. Let's look at the palmar side of the hand. Now you can see with this hand model next to Ellen's hand, you can see once we've taken the skin off, there are numerous structures here and all of these need to be carefully examined. You can see in this uh, model here, the yellow nerve is called the median nerve. The green nerve is called the ulnar nerve. You can see this red structure. This is called the radial artery that go and that the accompanying ulnar artery, which feeds into the superficial arch, which gives you blood vessels to the fingers. Underlying these structures, you'll see these blue structures. And these are the ropes. These are the tendons which allow you to move your fingers. So now we're sequentially going to examine these structures to rule out any pathology. So when we look at these palmar landmarks, we've taken the skin away. You'll see the most proximal ulnar aspect of the ulnar side of the wrist is the pisiform. And then if you go just distal and radial to this, or if you take your thumb and put it on the pisiform and press, aiming to the index finger MCP joint where your thumb tip rests, that's on the hook of the hamate. And then we'll go radial, and then you'll feel the distal pole of the scaphoid, and just distal and radial to the scaphoid, you'll feel the trapezium. And that is an important landmark, especially with patients who have basilar thumb joint arthritis. Again, let's go back to the acronym of STAND. We wanna look for the skin, see if there's any pathology. We're gonna sequentially examine the wrist flexors and the finger flexors. We're also gonna test the patency of the radial and ulnar arteries. We're gonna examine the nerves, the critical nerves to examine the median and the ulnar nerves. And then finally, we're gonna do dynamic tests. So when I look at her skin, I'm looking for any scars, any swelling, any bruising, any lacerations. Clearly, she doesn't have anything. Now I'm gonna examine the tendons. And I think it's important to sequentially do the wrist tendons and then the finger tendons. So when I look at the wrist tendons, there are essentially three tendons. We have the FCU tendon or the flexor carpi ulnaris. We have the palmaris longus tendon or the PL. In some patients, this is absent. And finally, we look at the flexor carpi radialis or the FCR. So Ellen, what I want you to do is make a fist and pull your wrist back as hard as you can. Pull it up, to, up, up, up. So you can see here is her, I can palpate her FCU. And this is important to palpate because as you come distally, remember the pisiform actually inserts within the FCU tendon. So sometimes patients can have pisotroquitral arthritis or FCU tendonitis and just relax. Now what I wanted to do is pull your thumb, your small finger, and pull your wrist back again. Here you can see this is her palmaris longus tendon. Essentially has minimal functional uh, relevance. We tend to use this actually if we need a tendon graft for surgery. And just relax. And now make a fist and pull your wrist up and to the side over here. And here you can feel this is her FCR tendon. Her FCR tendon is immediately radial to the part palmaris longus tendon, inserting into the base of the index finger metacarpal, and just relax. The next thing that we need to do, and I'll show you in the live examination, is test the flexor tendons. And it's important to differentiate which ones are moving which. Now remember, the FDP, or the flexor digitorum profundus tendon, flexes the DIP joint, and this has a common muscle belly. So it's important to um, protect the other fingers while you're testing the individual FDP tendons. And then finally, the FDS tendon flexes the uh, PIP joints. Essentially, each digit has two, the flexor digitorum superficialis or the flexor digitorum profundus or FDP. So now what I'd like to do is I'm going to hold your hand straight. I want you to bend the pinky just at that joint. So you can see as she bends the PIP joint, 
the DIP joint stays straight. So as I pull, so that's testing her FDS. And just relax. Bend this finger at this joint. That's FDS of the ring finger. Bend this one. That's FDS of the long finger. And bend this one. And that's FDS of the index finger. What we're next going to do is examine the FDPs. And the FDPs have common muscle bellies. So it's important to immobilize the other digits. Otherwise, the FDP of the neighboring digit will fire. So for her small finger, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold all the other fingers straight. Bend this joint for me at the tip. So that's the FDP of the small finger. Bend the tip here. This is FDP of the ring finger. Bend the tip here. FDP of the long finger. And bend this tip here. FDP of the index finger. And this is important, especially, for example, if somebody has a laceration to their palm and you're not sure what structures are injured. Because immediately here, through your clinical examination, you can determine if they have any pain. Now, one of the common pathologies in hand clinic is something called trigger finger. And trigger finger is where the finger gets locked. Now, the tendons, which are the ropes that help you bend your finger, essentially glide through little structures called pulleys. They're essentially rings around the tendons. And one of these pulleys, called the A1 pulley, can get inflamed where the finger catches and the patients can't extend. Now, in terms of the surface anatomy of these A1 pulleys, it's essentially volar to the MCP joint. So what I simply do is find the MCP joint of the affected digit, so you can see the index finger, and press right here. And usually the patients are very tender. And sometimes they will catch or sometimes they won't. And then I'll ask the patient to make a fist. And sometimes you can feel that catching. So that's an easy way to determine trigger finger. The final tendon to examine is the FPL or the flexor pollicis longus of the thumb. And essentially what I do here is take the thumb and bend it down for me. Strong, strong, strong. Good. And relax. This is an important tendon to examine, especially if a patient's had a previous wrist fracture and had a plate that was placed because sometimes the plates can be proud. And the first two tendons that will be irritated are the FPL tendon of the thumb. And so if a patient, for example, had a previous wrist fracture surgery, had a scar here, what I would do is put my fingers over and ask the patient to bend the thumb down. And if I feel crepitus of that tendon, then immediately I'd be thinking about maybe this tendon is threatened by that plate. The second tendon is the FDP of the index finger. The next thing that we're going to examine are the arteries. So remember, we have the radial artery and we have the ulnar artery giving perfusion to the hand. Now, in most patients, they form a complete arch, which means that they're linked. But sometimes you have an incomplete arch whereby the hand uh, blood supply is separated by the two arteries. So usually what I would do is, first of all, palpate the radial artery, which in most patients you can palpate. The ulnar artery is a little bit harder to palpate. And then what I would do is do an Allen's test. So what is an Allen's test? So essentially what I'll do is occlude the arteries. And then Ellen, squeeze your hand as hard as you can. Open and close. Keep going. And you can see how white her fingers are. And just relax. And now what I'll do is fingers out straight. Now I'll release the radial artery, and you can see how it immediately pinks up. So that tells me that she has a complete arch. So the radial artery goes all the way to the ulnar side. And again, so now I've occluded both, and now I want to look at the ulnar artery. And I'm looking at the radial digits to see if they pink up. So fingers straight. And as I relax, you can see how the radial sided digits also pink up. So she has a complete arch. So in terms of nerves, the most common nerve to assess on the palmar side is the median nerve. And this is the carpal tunnel nerve. This is where patients, for example, will come in and say that they can't sleep at night. They have to shake their hand to wake it up. They're on the cell phone. They have to change hands. Or if they're driving, they have to change hands. Or the fingers are becoming more clumsy. So the median nerve essentially innervates the thumb, the index long ring finger on the radial side of the ring finger. The small finger and the ulnar side of the small finger is innervated by the ulnar nerve. Now, the median nerve gives a motor supply to the abductor pollicis brevis, which is this nice thick muscle in the thumb. So the easiest way to test this is ask the patient, Ellen, just touch my thumb, lift it up, and you can see I'm testing the strength. Now, some patients will cheat. What they'll do is that they'll rotate their hand, they'll pronate, and as they're pronating, you think to yourself that they're firing the muscle. So what I'll classically do is hold the hand down in full supination. The next thing that I'll do is do that Tunnel sign where I'm tapping the nerve. So essentially, I'm tapping the nerve and in somebody with carpal tunnel, they'll complain of tingling in the fingers. Now, in terms of um, irritating the nerve and compressing the nerve, you can do the compression test where I simply press on here and see if that causes numbness and tingling. Or you can do a Phelan's test. So with the Phelan test, essentially by flexing the wrist, what you're doing is you're putting pressure on that yellow carpal tunnel nerve. And this is why night splints work, because night splints prevent you from flexing your wrist. 
So now if a patient complains of tingling in the thumb, index, and long, or the radial board of the ring finger, that would tell you that the median nerve is indeed compressed. We mentioned that the other nerve to examine is also the ulnar nerve. Now the ulnar nerve runs along the medial aspect of the forearm, and it runs between the pisiform and the hook of the hamate. So it comes through in this area. And usually when patients have numbness and tingling in the ring and small finger, it's invariably at the level of the elbow called cubital tunnel. But sometimes it can be compressed in this region, and this is called Guillaume's canal. And so what I would do again is elicit the tunnel, and also I would press on Guillaume's canal to see if that causes any numbness or tingling. Now, one of the ways to determine if the level of compression is either distal or proximal is if patients have normal feeling to the finger on the back. Because the dorsal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve, remember, comes off proximally from volar to dorsal. And so if patients have numbness at the back of their fingers, that will tell you that the pathology is actually coming from the elbow and not at Guillaume's canal. And then finally is the surface landmarks of the palm. Now, in terms of the bones, the majority of the bones can be examined from the back. There's less, less soft tissue, there's less structures at the back of the wrist. But in the palmar side, there's essentially four bones that you can examine. First of them is the pisiform. So this is the most proximal ulnar aspect here. Now, if you aim a line from your pisiform, aiming to your index finger um, MCP joint, or if you take your thumb and press your thumb IP joint and press here, that will land onto a bone here called the hook of the hamate. And this is a very important bone, for example, in patients who are playing baseball or golfers who hit a shot fat and they have a sudden onset of pain in this area, you can get a hook of a hamate fracture. And this is a very important clinical pearl because if you get standard AP and lateral x-rays, you will miss this diagnosis. On the radial side, the two bones to examine here are the trapezium. And the trapezium, you can feel a trapezial ridge right here. So remember, patients with basal or thumb joint pain will have pain. And proximal to this is the distal pole of the scaphoid. Thank you for joining us today. And hopefully you found some useful pearls in how to examine the wrist. There are many, many structures here. And the critical part of this is having a good understanding of surface anatomy and also the specific tests that we've delineated today. Remember the acronym of STAN, so look at the skin, examine the tendons, examine the arteries, the nerves, and the dynamic tests, because if you miss those out and you're not sequential in your thought processes, you will miss diagnoses. All right.